lynching preachers. So this is out of the conversation again. So this is by Malcolm Brian Foley, PhD, candidate in religion, historical studies, Baylor University. So lynching preachers, how black pastors resisted Jim Crow and white pastors incited racial racial violence. And so this is a still photo. This was a funeral that was held. This was back in 1945 for two victims of the KKK, George Dorsey and his sister, Dorothy Dorsey Malcolm of Walton County, Georgia. This was held at Mount Perry Baptist Church. And this was on a Sunday. This was, if you picture this scene, back in 1945. And so I really find these historical articles really interesting because why I find this interesting in particular is because they always say, oh, racism was a long time ago. And so when you look at some of the things in the past and you look at what's happening now with the Ahmaud Arbery case, the Kyle Rittenhouse case, you look at some of the uh, issues that have happened more um, uh, readily uh, that you can pull up in our time, like uh, Trayvon Martin, Rayona Taylor. Um, there's there's so many so many more situations that you can pull up, like right in our time now. And when I look at them, it's like a mirrored image that I see. And so white lynch mobs in America murdered at least 4,467 people between the years of 1883 to 1941. They, they were hanging, burning, dismembering, garroting, and blowtorching the victims. So their violence was widespread, but not indiscriminate. About 3,300 of the lynched were black, according to the most recent count by a sociologist, George Siegel and David Rigby. So the remaining dead were white, Mexican, of Mexican descent, Native American, Chinese, or Japanese. Such numbers, based on verifiable newspaper reports, represent a minimum. The full human toll of racial lynching may remain ever beyond reach. Religion has no barrier for these white murderers. As I've discovered in my research on Christianity, the lynch mobs in the Reconstruction Era South, white preachers incited racial violence joined the KKK clan and lynched black people. Sometimes the victim was a pastor. So buttressing white supremacy. So when considering American racial terror, the first question to answer is not how a lynch mob could kill a man of the cloth, but why white lynch mobs killed at all. So the typical answer from Southern apologists was that only black men who raped white women were targeted. So in this view, lynching was popular justice. And so the response of the aggrieved community to a heinous crime. And so you see pictured here what looks to be a lynch mob. So journalists like Ida B. Wells, okay, the historical Ida B. Wells, and the early sociologists like Monroe work saw through the smokescreen, finding that only about 20% to 25% of the lynch victims were alleged rapists, but about 3% were women and some were children, 
And so black people were lynched for murder or assault or on suspicion that they committed those crimes. So they could also be lynched for looking at a white woman, for bumping the shoulder of a white woman. And some were killed for being near or related to someone accused of aforementioned offenses. And so identifying the dead is supremely difficult work. So as sociologist Amy Kate Bailey and Stuart Tolmay argue pervasively in their 2015 book, Lynched, very little is known about lynching victims beyond gender and race. But by cross-referencing news reports with census data, scholars and civil rights organizations are covering more details. And so one might expect that mobs seeking to destabilize the Black community would focus on successful and influential people like preachers or prominent business owners. Instead, lynching disproportionately targeted lower status Black people, individuals society would not protect, like the agricultural worker Sam Hose of Georgia and men like Henry Smith, a Texas handyman, accused of raping and killing a three-year-old girl. And so the rope and the pyre snuffed out primarily the socially marginal. And so the unemployed, the unmarried, the precarious, and often not prominent, so who expressed any disconsent with racial caste. So that's because lynching was a form of social control as well. So by killing workers with few connections who could be economically replaced and doing so in brutal public ways that struck terror into Black communities, lynching kept white supremacy on track. So fight from the front lines. So Black ministers weren't often uh, lynching victims, but they could be targeted if they got in the way. So I.T. Buttress, a preacher in Putnam County, Florida, was hanged in 1894, after being accused of planning an instigate to instigate a revolt, according to May 30, 1894 story in Atlanta Constitution newspaper. Uh, Atlanta Constitution newspaper. So later that year, in December, the Constitution also reported uh, Lucius Turner, a preacher near West Point. Georgia was shot by two brothers who were apparently writing an insulting note to their sister. So Ida B. Wells wrote in 1895 editorial, a red record about Reverend King, a minister in Paris, Texas, who was beaten with a Winchester rifle and placed on a train out of town. So his offense, he said, was being the only person in Lamar County to speak against the horrific 1893 lynching of the hand, handyman Henry Smith. So in each of these cases, the victim's profession was ancillary to their lynching. But preaching was not incidental to Black pastors' resistance to lynching. So My dissertion research shows Black pastors across the U.S. spoke out against racial violence during the worst period, despite the clear danger that it put them in. And so I want to stop for a minute there. So back in that time, preachers that were Black preachers and pastors seemed more militant. They weren't as passive as what you have, have seen. And It was a different time, different era, different generation of people, and there were a lot more racial violence. And what we're seeing now, we don't see enough of of what we've seen recently, where a comment was made from a lawyer um, 
or based on the Amar, uh, um, Ahmad Arbery case where he suggested that not that they don't have pastors in the courtroom, that they don't have, he was specific, they don't have more black pastors come into the courtroom because he claimed that it was an influence on the jury. And the way he said it, it, it came off as racist. And to see something like that in this time, 2021, in this year, what does that say to anyone who is involved in any type of religious group that he's calling you out, basically? And so if you're not real, then you ain't going to stand up and you ain't going to see what's going on. And if you weren't real to begin with, you better get real. Because we're moving into a different time. And so this clearly shows that we're going actually reverting back to the way it was. And so when we see these trials, it's only a matter of time when there'll be sanctioned violence all over again. Just like it was back in the 18, early 1800, 1900s. And so... Many like the Washington, D.C. Presbyterian pastor Francis Gremick preached to their congregation about racial violence. So Gremick argued for comprehensive anti-racist education as a way to undermine the narratives that led to lynching. So other pastors wrote furiously about anti-Black violence. Okay. So Charles Price Jones, the founder of the Church of God Holiness in Mississippi, for example, wrote poetry affirming the African heritage of Black Americans. Sutton Briggs, a pastor that is a Black uh, Baptist pastor of Texas, wrote novels that were in reality thinly veiled political treaties and Pastors wrote articles against lynching in their own denominational newspapers. So this was a different group of people entirely. And what their purpose was intended was the upliftment of of people who were being oppressed. It wasn't about, I'm going to take money out of the community. It wasn't about, I'm going to belittle this group of Black people because they're not in line with this other group of Black people. It wasn't about, oh, we're going to create divisions within our own culture. No, it was about getting together on one accord because we have one thing that is happening. We know we share in common, that we are being discriminated and we are being killed. And so it wasn't about separating. It was about uniting and coming together and bringing about an awareness on how to defend themselves. And they did it through their paper. They did it through their churches. They did it through their outreach. So it was a lot different than what you have seen in more recent days. But now, since we have them on the media making a mockery of the ones that claim to be preachers, the real preachers need to stand up. If you're about doing something religious, let's throw religion out of here. Let's use spirituality and say, is this spiritually sound behavior to create a, a society where one group is favored over another or a supreme group is favored over another and the law favors in the side of the supreme group the law is corrupt the land is corrupt so if you're going to see that and not say anything about it and stand up then you're not you're not really for the people you're not really there to do a service you're doing a disservice so when those preachers went out and showed up in full force they said let's throw away all of our differences let's throw away all of our divisions And let's come together on one accord. We see what's going on. We're not going to back down. And that's the attitude that you're supposed to have. That 
is actually people make up the spirituality in as a whole body, not a couple of books and a couple of songs and how people dress. So this same world that we're all living in, if you see what's going on, then you're going to wake up to what's happening. It's reverting back to a time that we don't want to see, but we're seeing it slowly unfold all over again. And so by any means necessary, let me get into this. So some white pastors decried racial terror too, but others use the pulpit to incite violence. Okay. And to instigate it. And so on June 21, 1903, white pastors, all that Presbyterian church in Delaware used his religious leadership to incite a lynching. Let me read that again. This was in 1903, June the 21st, the white pastor of all of that Presbyterian church in Delaware used his religious leadership to incite a lynching. So preaching to a crowd of 3,000 gathered in downtown Wilmington, Reverend Robert A. Elwood urged the jury in the trial of George White, a black farm laborer accused of raping and killing a 17-year-old white girl, Helen Bishop, to pronounce white guilty, uh, white guilty speedily. Okay, so otherwise, Elwood continued, according to June 23rd, 1903, New York Times article, white should be lynched. So he cited the Bible text. This was from Corinthians 5 and 3, 13, that is. So in the text, it says, which orders Christians to expel the wicked person from among you. And so the same people that you go to church and you listen to this stuff that you hear, use the same text to murder and kill your people. And so that's why I don't follow it. Because you know why? Because they were using it for a specific purpose to wipe out black folks, to kill and murder and, 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 and dismember and cruelly uh, pretty much, how would I want to say it, execute black people from children on up. And so if they had to use the Bible, which is so influential, and these texts text out of scriptures, to do it, to lead the lynch mob, then so be it. And so that was their by any means necessary tactic to use. So the responsibility for lynching would be yours for delaying the execution of the law, Elwood thundered, exhorting to the jury. So the same mentality that we're seeing today is not unfamiliar. So George White was dragged out of jail the next day, bound and burned alive in front of 2,000 people. So following Sunday, a black pastor named Montrose W. Thornton discussed the week's barber trees with his own congregation in Wilmington and urged self-defense. Now let's see how that plays out in terms of black people. So there is one part left for the persecution or the persecuted Negro when charged with crime when innocent. Be a law unto yourself, he told his parishioners. Die in your tracks, perhaps drinking the blood of your pursuer. Newspapers around the country denounce both sermons. So an editorial in the Washington Star said both pastors had con contributed to the worst passions of the mob. So by inciting lynching and advocating for self-defense, and I'm stressing that, the editors 
Judge Elwood and Thornton had brought the pulpit into disrepute. And so, basically, it says this article was republished from the conversation, a nonprofit news site dedicated to sharing ideas and academic uh, from the academic experts. It, it was written by Malcolm Brian Foley out of Baylor University. So you can get our highlights each year weekend and so I thought this was a really good article because it goes in line with what we just seen with the trials and what we were seeing still with the Ahmaud Arbery trial and the issue of not having the pastors be an influence of the jury when that's what they usually were back in this time that they were an influence but It always seems like on the opposing end when black people or black pastors of color are influencing their people to stand up and be powerful and rise to the occasion and to defend themselves, it's always viewed on a whole nother level. And it's looked at as we have to shut them down Um, and they will do it. In, in the most vicious way that they can see fit. And so I just thought I would make mention of this because even though you have some people will say, this was so long ago, it really isn't because some of those people that you see standing there are to this day, there's some bodies, there's people that were still living right now that may be their great-great-grandchildren that either may be against this practice or they're for it. That might be the reason why the justice system is so messed up as it is now that I feel. And there's two Americas. There's this system where it's favoring one group over another. And if one person claims self-defense, it is well taken and it is, it is accepted. And if another claims self-defense, it's looked at as that person is a criminal and they have to be prosecuted or they have to be put to death or murdered or burned alive. You know, and so there's two justices and one seems to favor the other over the other. 